All right, let's finish our lectures on um, the era of boring presidents or industrial politics. Um, Populist at first did not pay much attention to the silver question, uh, but ultimately the, the donations of silver miners uh, helped finance their campaigns. As 1896 approached, Republicans were emboldened by Cleveland's ineffective or really just non-existent dealing with the economy. There was a powerful Republican, uh, the boss of the Ohio State machine named Mark Hanna, and he helped Governor William McKinley of Ohio get the nomination. Uh, you'll recall that uh, McKinley was a congressman who lost his seat after passing uh, a really, really high tariff, the McKinley tariff. He'd since become governor of Ohio. Ohio's a swing state. And so Hannah uh, uh, backs uh, McKinley to get the nomination. The Republican Party opposed the free coinage of silver, of course, ex uh, except by an agreement with leading commercial nations. In other words, if France and Britain and so forth, Germany would agree to uh, bimetallism, uh, we would too. But of course, that would never happen. So it was sort of a, well, we'd do this, but uh, we can't. 34 delegates, uh, Republican delegates from the mountains and plains states, walked out of the convention because of their um, deflationist policies and joined the Democratic Party. The Democratic Convention of 1896 was very dramatic. Southern and Western delegates uh, were eager to neutralize the challenge to the People's Party, uh, and they wanted control of the party from the conservative Easterners, people like uh, Cleveland. So they called for tariff reduction, an income tax, stricter control of trusts and railroads, and most importantly, free silver. They also wanted to nominate a pro-silver candidate. The Easterners echoed the Republicans by rejecting free silver except by agreement with other nations. The debate between these two competing platforms dominated the convention. Defenders of the gold standard seemed to dominate until the final speech. Then, William Jennings Bryan, who was a handsome 36-year-old uh, congressman from Nebraska, he addressed the convention. He was a very gifted orator. He was known as the Boy Orator of the Platte, meaning the Platte River Valley. And he delivered one of the most famous political speeches in American history. It's become known as the Cross of Gold speech. Uh, here's some of what he said. I'm, I'm William Jennings Bryan. If they dare to come out in the open and defend the gold standard as a good thing, we will fight them to the uttermost, having behind us the producing masses of this nation and the world, supported by the commercial interest, the laboring interest, and the toilers everywhere. We will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. It's using very dramatic, fiery, uh, Protestant Christian imagery uh, to fight the inflationist. Um, it was an incredibly successful speech, <clears throat> and it led to the adoption of free silver in the platform, and it gave the agrarian interest uh, in the party a leader. They nominated uh, Bryant, uh, Brian to be the... Um, the presidential candidate. He was and remains the youngest person ever nominated by a major party. He was 36, uh, barely old enough to be president. Uh, his admirers hailed Bryan as the great commoner, but Republicans and conservative Democrats thought him a dangerous demagogue. He was a potent symbol of rural, Protestant, middle-class America. He was a lawyer. The Democratic adoption of free silver and the nomination of Bryan put the populist in a difficult position. Uh, they had not had their, their uh, convention yet, and they expected both parties, Democrat and Republican, to protect the gold standard. The Democrats had stolen uh, their thunder. To nominate someone else would split the protest vote. Uh, reluctantly, the populists embraced free silver, although they felt there were much more important issues. Now, some populists resisted uh, this embrace of free silver as a, the, the major uh, the major. Uh, uh, platform issue for them uh, because they felt uh, it would destroy their party. It turns out they were right. But after much difficult debate, the populist nominated uh, Brian uh, as the People's Party candidate. In other words, uh, by nominating him um, to be the, uh, the People's Party candidate, he was already nominated the Democratic candidate, the, the Democrats effectively uh, swallowed uh, the People's Party. They didn't want to spl split their, uh, their vote. Here we actually see the People's Party swallowing the Democratic Party uh, with, with Brian as the head of this giant snake. It's a much older Brian. Um, actually, he went bald later. Um, anyway, um, the, the campaign of 1896 produced desperation among conservatives. The business and financial community was frightened beyond reason by the idea of a Brian victory and poured money 
into McKinley's campaign. They spent $7 million versus 300000 for Democrats. McKinley held the tradition that candidates do not actively campaign for office. That sounds funny, but throughout American history to this point, that they didn't. Uh, they didn't. They didn't run for president. They stood for president. Um, and he ran what was known as his front porch campaign. He spent the whole campaign on his front porch uh, receiving party visitors all, and, and journalists, all carefully choreographed by Hannah. Bryan, however, became the first presidential candidate to systematically stump every section of the country asking to be president. He traveled 18,000 miles and addressed an estimated 5 million people. This, this photo is, is, is actually taken from the campaign. He may have done himself more harm than good. His revivalistic camp-style meeting pleased old-stock Protestants, but it made Democrats, um, many Democrats, like Catholic, uh, Catholics and uh, immigrants, very nervous. Uh, William Jennings Bryan seemed the embodiment of the Protestant morality that had often been directed against them. Bryan helped establish modern politics, but he antagonized many along the way who saw his campaign as undignified. McKinley beat uh, Bryan, 271 electoral votes to 176, uh, and um, he uh, also um, won the popular vote, 51.1 percent uh, to 47.7 um, um, percent of the popular vote. Bryan carried the South and West, but his program, like that of the populist, was too narrow to win a presidential election. This map is fascinating because you see uh, the, the Democrats are, are the, uh, the blue the blue states, and of course they carried mostly the South and the West, the agrarian interest, while as the Republicans, the red states, carried the uh, industrial Northeast. It's also kind of funny because this is sort of the opposite of, of blue states and red states today. Within, uh, within months of the election, the People's Party began to dissolve. They had gambled everything on their fusion with the Democrats, and never again, frankly, would a large group of Americans raise so powerful a protest uh, against the industrial economy. Now, the, uh, the administration of, of William McKinley saw a return to calm partly because of the exhaustion of the dissenters. Um, uh, by the time McKinley took office, labor unrest, which had so scared the middle class, had subsided. With the decline of the agrarian revolt, this meant that both great destabilizing forces in American politics were at least temporarily in retreat. The McKinley administration was shrewd and committed to assuring stability. There was also a gradual easing of the economic crisis, which undercut agitation for change. McKinley focused on the one issue of importance to Republicans, the tariff. Within weeks of McKinley taking office, the, he uh, signed the Dingley Tariff, which raised tariffs to their highest point ever. McKinley was delicate on the silver issue, sending a delegation to Europe to explore the idea of bimetallism. It went nowhere, as expected. And so uh, in 1900, the Republicans enacted the Currency Act of 1900, also known as the Gold Standard Act, uh, committing the economy to gold. Economic forces seemed to vindicate the conservatives. Prosperity began re to return uh, in 1898. Foreign crop failures helped American farm prices, and businesses began to expand again. But while the free silver movement failed, the quarter century before 1900 had seen spectacular growth with a currency that had not kept pace. The gold supply had remained relatively constant. Populist predictions of financial disaster might have proved correct had not fate intervened. In the late 1890s, new technologies were discovered for extraction of gold from low-content ores. Uh, so new technology, industrialization saves the day, begins to get more uh, gold out of the ore than we could have gotten before. And at the same time, huge new gold deposits are discovered in Alaska, South Africa, and Australia. Also in the Yukon Territory in Canada, uh, neighboring Alaska. That's a picture I have here. In 1898, Two and a half times as much gold was produced as in 1890, and the currency supply was soon inflated beyond anything the free silver uh, movement uh, had imagined. Uh, so they got their inflation uh, through the, the inter intervention of fate and the discovery of a lot more gold. By then, uh, Bryant and, and other Americans were engaged in another new major issue, the possibility of America becoming an imperialist nation, and we'll uh, talk about that uh, soon.